Hello and welcome everyone to this uh, series of conversations that we are doing on uh, uh, youth uh, change makers across countries of the Asia Pacific, people who are doing trailblazing work in, in the area of sexual health and reproductive health and rights. Uh, this is ahead of the uh, regional youth festival on sexual and reproductive health and rights hosted by Arrow later this month. Um, we have with us today Sabir Ali, who works with Rural Development Foundation, uh, Pakistan, and they've done some path-breaking work in the area of climate change and uh, gender justice and sexual and reproductive health and rights. So, Sabir, welcome and uh, tell us a bit about your project. Thank you, Samita. We we started the project in Pakistan on on an idea to. Uh, raise awareness on the interlinkages of climate change on the sexual and reproductive health and rights. So we particularly picked up two points where the reproductive health and the family planning services. So we focused on these two parts while we were raising our awareness. So how this project started and how this project led to our results, so I'll go one by one. So we started the project based on establishment of a working group. So we, we established three working groups in uh, our three project districts. So in these working groups, we, we titled it as Saheli working groups. So these, these group members were all women and girls who were also part of the community. So the women uh, members, was, some women members were from the local government representatives, some women from the civil society organizations, and some women from the community. So we gathered them in, in, in a group and we built their capacities on the interlinkages of climate change and its negative implications on the reproductive health and family planning services. So, while we uh, while we were uh, establishing the group, we also focused on raising awareness and generating a dialogue through a storytelling sessions. So we started storytelling sessions with women and girls in the community, and we heard their stories of how the climate change has impacted their lives. Since Sindh province in Pakistan is very prone to the floods. And, and the recent flash floods has also impacted the Sindh province very drastically. So, and they were they were stories that emerged out of the out of women, out of girls, uh, who shared their stories of how their life lives were impacted due to floods. So, some shared that they were um, they were harassed at the uh, at the relief camps. There were increased gender-based violence in the in the camps while they have relocated themselves due to floods. So there was some there was a number of stories that emerged due to storytelling, and that's how we triggered a dialogue among women and girls of the negative implications, which also which also led us to share and sensitize them on how, what are the negative implications of climate change on the reproductive health and their family planning services. And also, uh, what is the gap in 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 the policy making? Because in the in the climate change policy making and decision making process, there is zero engagement and zero participation of women and girls. And that is why there is lack of services that are existed in the in the community. So we we started sensitization through storytelling session and dialogue session to sensitize them uh, and protect them from the abuse. So, uh, and also uh, after the storytelling session, we, is, we established uh, the Saheli working groups and through the Saheli working groups, we started quarterly meetings with them. And, and in those quarterly meetings, we, uh, we were able to sensitize them on the, uh, the gaps in the policy making and decision making process. Mm, uh, uh, and we, we developed action plans of advocacy with the policy makers, with the government departments, and with the local government representatives. Excellent. To so, yes. uh, so curious to know, uh, when you say the impact of climate change on uh, gender, can you just give us a few examples of uh, what you mean by that? But the, when we say about the impact of the climate change on gender particularly, we mean that the increasing vulnerabilities 
of of the of the vulnerable groups that in, that includes women that includes girls that includes transgender persons so while uh, when whenever there is a flood there's a high risk of abuse there is a high risk of exploitation and there's a high risk of uh, uh, you know food shortages for women for girls and for transgender persons so particularly when we say the gender and, and, and the reproductive health then there there is a part, there is a gap and there is an impact on the reproductive health because uh, uh, people only focus on providing food and the government only focus on providing food while they ignore the reproductive health there are no provision of the sanitary pads there are no provision of the family planning medicines and there are no provision of you know, protecting children from sexual abuse so the, we mean the the impact is on the gender excellent that really helps me understand uh, great so uh, you, you were mentioning that the project has uh, you know been working for about uh, 2 years now so uh, if you can just highlight some uh, which you think are like uh, your achievements you know uh, something that made you feel that you really have made an impact to people's lives yes uh, so uh, the project has contributed in a significant changes or in people's minds so while we were Im implementing our storytelling sessions it was purely engagement with young girls and women in the community so while while, while we started the conversation and while we had the first uh, storytelling session but there was a there was a girl who uh, who has attended the storytelling session shared their stories and and then later on she shared the learning in their home so her father not only uh, appreciated the her participation but also sent her in a, his another daughter to our another storytelling session so we we believe this was a major achievement which has not only sensitized girls and women but also sensitized men as they as they were uh, they were able to understand the negative implications and they wanted their daughters and uh, and women to understand the impacts right so when you say a storytelling session what exactly does it mean so uh, the, the storytelling session we started stories so while i started the story that i am sabir i am a part of this area and i was uh, i was suffering from let's say a, a diarrhea disease in in 2010 and when the flood came over we started relocation from our area and we shifted to this place but there were no tents there were no medicines there were no reproductive health services and i and due to this lack of the services i my disease uh, my disease severity increased and i was not able to uh, to hold it or cure it so and there is why this is the implication of their marriage and my health we do you mean this so therefore you will ask other people to share their stories yes we started sharing our stories by ourselves and then people uh, the participants who were part of the, the storytelling sessions shared their stories one by one one by one and that's how it triggered a dialogue in the end and when we we started we started a dialogue on on the lack of services existed because there is no participation of women and girls in the policy making and decision making process great so when you're saying the uh, goal and the uh, objective is to increase the participation of women and girls uh, do you think uh, the project has uh, moved forward in that context yes uh, we strongly believe that uh, we have uh, marked our way to the project goals because uh, while we were implementing the project the one of the member who is also part of the saheli working group and also part of the local government she presented a first ever a uh, resolution in the local government assembly and we were asking the government and the relevant departments to uh, include women and include young girls in the climate change policy making and decision making process to overcome this so we believe it's a major it's a major goal for us that we raised our voice and our voice has reached to the assemblies right excellent so um uh, what were some of the challenges when you were with the community well uh, the, actually our project has uh, been initiated while there was covid so uh, our major uh, major challenge was uh, uh, i mean just taking taking risks 
to uh, raise awareness while taking care of the health of the community and while taking care of the uh, health of the staff as well who are working on the ground. So we started risk mitigation strategies. So while uh, before implementing every uh, activity, we uh, we developed a risk mitigation strategies and we analyzed every risk that we may have. So for example, if we felt that we have a risk of the COVID contraction. The, so what we did is we ensured a physical distance uh, in the community while uh, during implementation of the activity, we provided the face masks to participants and the staff, and we provided the hand sanitizers to the staff. Also, the major challenge comes as, uh, uh, you know, a civic space shrinking because uh, the civic spaces were shrinking, uh, the CSOs were not allowed to uh, fundraise for their projects. And that is how uh, the pro uh, there were some, some of the challenges that the civil society organizations were restricted to take part in the uh, awareness and mobilization. Lovely, excellent. So if you can uh, share a bit about the kind of mentoring and support and help you received from Arrow in this whole process. Yes, we are very thankful to Arrow for providing us such a mentorship. So uh, in, in the uh, in the work initiative lab that uh, lab one and lab two that I was a participant, we were briefly, uh, our capacities were briefly built on how to develop a prototype, how to develop an idea and how to work on that idea. Uh, uh, our, our capacities were built on uh, not only developing the idea, but refining it, um, building the application, building the bu its budget and how the uh, the, ch the challenges can be minimized or mitigated. So we all receive those trainings, we receive those capacities and information from Arrow and that helped us achieving the project goals and implementing the project in a timely manner. Lovely. So uh, really curious to know, uh, you know, when we talk, when we talk of, uh, you know, I'd just like to know a bit more about the community that you work with and uh, the major sexual and reproductive health, uh, you know, rights issues that are uh, most important for women and girls in the community that you work with. Yeah, so we, we were uh, implementing project purely with women and girls. And in the community that is very prone to the floods. So while Saint province is entirely very prone to the floods and cyclones, or the districts we choose uh, were also very prone to the floods. And those were the districts where the 2010 flood have uh, brought a havoc for people's lives. So we, we sat with the communities uh, which were impacted by floods and we, we heard about their stories of, and we started their sensitization on uh, participation in policy making and decision making process. And if their participation is ensured in the climate change policy making and decision making process, it will lead to a better service delivery during climate events uh, and will reduce the vulnerabilities of women and girls. Right, uh, great. So, um, you know, maybe like uh, over the two years that you've worked, uh, are there any, uh, you know, specific women and girls that spring to your mind who you think have really been empowered by this project? Yes, we strongly believe that what we did was a, a we generated a spark among women and girls' lives. So while we were implementing a storytelling session, there were a number of girls and there were a number of women who who uh, contacted us after the after the event and they wanted to advocate by themselves for the in, uh, inclusion in the climate change policy making a decision making process and improving access to uh, sexual and reproductive health services so uh, and and this was not only a pledge but we uh, we realized that uh, voluntarily uh, there were more than 15 women who started their own group and uh, uh, as a, as you know, as an informal group to advocate for inclusion of women and girls in the climate change policy making. So we uh, we believe that was our major major milestone because it led to the sustainability of the project. Because the project was not only a one time initiative. We believe it is an ongoing uh, initiative that is still leading to our goal and uh, uh, ultimately will reach the goal by different informal groups by different interventions. Great. So what has been the role of uh, 
men and boys, was there any kind of a resistance that you found when you were working with women and girls? Well, while while you are working on such a sensitive topic in, in, in such a country, there is always resistance. There are always backlash from people who are uh, who are governed by the patriarchal structure and who are governed by the uh, you know by the religious thoughts. So you always face backlash when you talk about the sexual and reproductive health. But what we did is uh, we developed risk mitigation strategies before implementing our every activities. So, I, so if, for example, if we felt that there might be a backlash from such a group, we started engaging with them prior to the activity. So, and we sensitized them on the importance of an act, the activity and importance of the project for the community. And that's how we mitigated the risk. And that's how we, we minimized the chances of the backlash by the, uh, by the different groups. Right, right. So you were also mentioning that uh, the recent floods also affected the communities that you work with. Yes. Right, right. Uh, so were they active in some way in, uh, you know, uh, raising their voice or coming together or in any way? Yes, because uh, because we the the Saheli working group, which uh, are uh, we built their capacities on the you know interlinkages of the climate change and their events on the reproductive health, so they were able to understand. So when the flash floods hit those uh, communities, they knew that these kind of challenges can arise, and they knew that how to mitigate those challenges. So the um, the members of the Saheli Working Group were active in, uh, you know, in sensitizing and uh, raising awareness among the camps that were part of to prevent uh, sexual harassment, to prevent gender-based violence, and to prevent, you know, the, the the abuse for the reproductive health and the family planning services. So the Saheli Working Group, which were empowered to uh, and their capacities were built, they played their key role in the recent flood in Pakistan. That's really very inspiring and excellent to know. So tell us a bit more about how you train the Saheli working groups and how do they work? The, the Saheli working group is actually, it, it, it's a, uh, it's a combination of uh, of women and girls uh, from different parts of life. So uh, what we do is we provide our office space to them uh, so that they can, uh, they can search things on the internet they can uh, initiate a dialogue with themselves. They can uh, initiate their advocacy plans. And we also provide them support from the Rural Development Foundation on different strategies of engagement. For example, if they want to advocate with policymakers from the climate change department. So we link them up with the climate change department. They present their challenges and their action plans with them. And that's how the, the, the initiative is going and are, are generating results. Excellent. So what has been the response of policymakers to these women? Yes, the response of the policymakers were initially very surprising because the departments did not knew the negative implications of the climate change on the reproductive health and family planning services. And each department that the Saheli Working Group has visited, they shared that they were surprised of not knowing at all about these negative implications. But uh, um, but during uh, I mean uh, during the time that they uh, that they they shared the challenges and they shared their inputs and advocacy strategies with those policymakers, they started to realize that these challenges exist on the ground and there is a need of addressing those challenges. So they started responding in a positive manner. They are responding and they responded in a, in a manner that they are willing to uh, include women and girls. Through the uh, through the procedures and started inviting them to different their initiatives. So uh, the the climate change department um, in Sin has invited members of the Saheli working groups to sit with them and review the existing policy and identify those gaps which are responsible for lack of service delivery. That's how the the, the positive responses are generated through the edu uh, consistent advocacy by the Saheli working groups. Absolutely. Excellent. That is like real uh, being a change maker and doing like really trailblazing work. So uh, what about plans for way forward? How do you see, uh, you know, the months and years ahead on this work that you have started? 
Yes, so while uh, we have a plan, we all, the Rural Development Foundation has developed a sustainable uh, strat sustainability strategy for the, uh, for, the, for the project. So while moving forward, we will be taking this project as, an, as a long-term uh, initiative and including uh, youth and young boys as well in the initiative. So we will be using a different digital uh, engagement strategies um, for the project in the upcoming months. And we will be sensitizing public and youth to be advocate for climate change and its negative implications on the reproductive health and family planning services and to advocate for inclusion of women, girls, and transgender persons in the policy making through our digital engagement. So we are, we are moving forward with the same uh, initiative, but are using different innovation uh, in the project to reach our goal. Great. So, um, uh, Sabin, that's really wonderful to know. Uh, so, we've spoken a bit about women and girls, but we haven't really spoken yet on uh, the uh, transsexual community. So, would you like to share a bit more about their specific challenges? Yes, there are specific challenges for the trans women and trans men as well. But do you know that the, the country we live in is, uh, is entirely going by the religious thoughts and by the patriarchal structure. So there is a very lack of acceptance for the trans women who do not come out and who do not show up even among the women because there is also a lack of uh, lack of acceptability by men for them to sit with their women and share. So, uh, but but we have a we have a different uh, project from the uh, Women Fund Asia that we are implementing, and we are holding uh, collective feminist dialogues. So we are uh, we are gathering with the uh, trans women, and we are gathering with the cisgender women, and we are uh, analyzing what are the collective challenges that are faced by women and trans women collectively, and what are the collective advocacy plans that these challenges can be mitigated. Excellent. Thank you so much, Sabir. It has been really wonderful and really inspiring to hear about the work that uh, you are doing. And uh, congratulations on all the good work and best wishes. Thank, Thank you, you very much for providing time. such an opportunity. And uh, yeah, for everyone else who's uh, listening in, uh, uh, you know, you can uh, follow the Arrow Malaysia website to know more about the regional youth festival that is uh, happening later this month in Kuala Lumpur, uh, Malaysia. Thank you. Thank you.